Hey folks, welcome back for another episode of Code Club. In the last episode, I showed you how I went about recreating this figure that was taken from a report published by Oxford University Press on how researchers are using and responding to AI in their work. If you want to get a hold of that previous video, I'll put a link up here. If you want to get a hold of this report, it's down below in the description, as is a link to a newsletter article that I wrote describing how I would go about regenerating this. Well, as I look at this figure, there's a few things that really stand out to me that really kind of annoy me, <laughs> right? So first of all, there's a lot going on here, right? There's numbers on each of these columns to tell me the percentages, right? And so there's just tons of text, there's tons of colors, it's really complicated, there's really just a lot to look at here. Also, with all this text, to fit it all in, they make it all really small, right? And so you almost need a magnifying glass to look at some of these numbers, and some of these numbers are so small and there's just so much little space that you're not quite sure like what that number is there, right? That's like a 31, perhaps, right? So the next thing is that it's very difficult to interpret the overall data, that they have these questions or the categories that they surveyed the investigators on, but there's no logical order to it, right? The title tells us that AI has been most commonly used to support the discovery of existing research followed by editing the research write-up. Well, where is that? Oh, well, here's discovering existing research, and oh, all the way over here is editing write-up of, of research, right? And so what I would pref prefer to have would be to sort these by the N, the number of respondents overall, regardless of their personal opinion about AI. And so I think that would have made for a far more attractive uh, visual. The other thing is that with all this color, and all these bars, there's a lot of ink, if you will, on this plot. So what I'm gonna to try to do in this episode is to convert this figure into what I would call a dot plot. And so in my thinking, what I'm going to go for is on the y-axis, I want to have these questions written out so you can read them easily from left to right. And then going across the x-axis will be the percent of researchers within each of these different cohorts or categories of researchers with a symbol indicating where that group fell. Um, there is a lot of color here, right? So there's eight different groups. It's kind of hard to have eight different plotting symbols and to keep track of all that. So maybe what I'll do is I'll have eight different colors like I have had here. The difficulty with that is that it's very difficult to pick colors that are not um, red green, right? Maybe what we could do instead would be to have a gradient going from blue indicating cold, like a challenger, to red, like a pioneer, someone that's really hot for the technology. So maybe that's what we could do, is we could design a color palette that goes across those shades of colors. We'll see how it looks, but that's what I'm gonna try to do in today's episode of Code Club. Over here in our studio, I have a script.plot.r. If you wanna get this code that I'm starting with, as well as all of the code that I generate today, down below in the description, there's a link to a blog post where you can get all of this great information. I'll go ahead and load all of this. And if we look at OUP data, uh, you'll see that there's a column for the question, right? That's what was going across the x-axis. And then the cohort, that was the different colors or the grouping within each of the questions. The positives were the number of the 2,300 researchers that were positive, that had indicated they'd used it before for this task or that they'd be willing to use it for this task and then the rate for each individual cohort. We now need to turn this into a dot plot. So we'll start with OUP data, piping that to ggplot, and then our AES mapping. On the x-axis, I'm gonna put the rate. On the y-axis then, I'm gonna put the question, okay? And then the color, I'm gonna put the cohort. And I'm gonna plot this by doing geom point. And so what we can see is that we can't see much at all, right? And so I think that is largely because my titles here are just blocking everything up. So for right now, why don't I go ahead and remove the legend? I'll do show.legend equals false. And so now you can get a better sense of what I'm going for here, right? Where we have the question and then we have the, um, the responses, right? The rate for the different uh, cohorts of the different propensity of people liking the use of AI. And so I'm trying to think about what I want to do first. So why don't we start with some easy things and I'll do theme classic to simplify the appearance. 
Um, I'll also do labs on the x-axis. I'll say percent of researchers in favor. And then um, on my y, I'm going to put null because I don't think that's super helpful um, as, as, a, as a title. And I, I think it's clear that these are different categories that people are being questioned about. And oh, it didn't get my theme classic because I forgot the plus sign. There you go. And so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and save this out uh, using GG Save. I always like to save the image out before I start mucking with things too much because the, the size and the aspect ratio of the figure and even the format of the figure can affect the way things appear. So I'm going to go ahead and save this as ai.plot.png. My width, I'll make, say, 3. My height, I'll make 5. And that's what we've got so far. Um, maybe I'll go ahead and make it a bit wider. Let's go ahead and do 5 by 5. I think that looks good. We might, we might change that here in a bit. But for now, I'm pretty happy with that appearance. Let's go ahead and add back in the legend. So we'll go ahead and remove that show legend equals false. So I think I'm going to start kind of where I ended in the last episode by adding in the number and perhaps putting these titles across two lines. They're really long and it's really sucking up a lot of the space that we have um, for the rest of the plot. I'd rather do that line wrap than make the font smaller. So let's start there. Okay. So I'm going to add a column to this that I'm going to call pretty uh, for a pretty label. And that is going to be taking the question and the positives and merging it together. I like to use the glue function from the glue package. So we'll do library glue. And then down here, we'll do pretty glue. And then in quotes within curly braces, we're going to put the question and then space and then in parentheses n equals. And then again, in curly braces, we'll put positives and then a close parenthesis. And I need a comma here. All right. And so now what I'll do is instead of putting question on the y-axis, I'll go ahead and put pretty. Great. So now what we get is the reformatted y-axis titles, but I would like to reorder everything by the n, right? And so to do this, we can use a package called forecats, um, which I think is installed with tidyverse, but let's just make it explicit. And that will allow us to create a factor um, pretty. So I'll do FCT reorder. And so we're going to treat the pretty label as the title, but it's going to become a factor. And we're going to reorder it by positives. So now when we look at our plot, we have all of our data sorted by the n. Pretty slick, right? And so now what I'm going to do is add in some line breaks in here so that my titles go over two rows so that we're not using so much space in this plot for the title. I'll come right back after I've done that. So I went ahead and added in those backslash ends to make line breaks. This is what I'm left with. A lot more real estate, of course, to visualize what is going on. Um, and But I now notice that my text is right justified, which is fine. I'd like to see if it could maybe be left justified. So we can modify that with the theme function, where we'll do axis.text.y, element text, and then we'll do h just equals zero. So zero is left, one is right justified, and 0.5 is centered. And so now we have everything justified like so. Um, I'm not sure which I prefer better, um, but I think that works pretty well. I think I want to go ahead and get rid of those tick marks on the y axis, uh, which we can do axis.ticks.y equals element blank. I'm really happy with the way this y axis turned out. I might want to come back and adjust things later on, but for now, I'm pretty happy with the way this looks. Um, and the next thing I want to turn my attention to is this cohort uh, in the legend. And I noticed that the labels here are in alphabetical order rather than in the order of um, support of using AI for these different techniques. And so as we've seen before, I'm going to use a factor to go ahead and reorder these according to the order that I want them to be in. Okay. And so I'm going to come back up here and I'm going to make our cohort a factor. And I'm going to basically make this a factor and I'm going to set the levels of that factor to be the same thing as this vector. So that I'm not duplicating my code too much, I'm going to go ahead and make a vector that I'll call cohorts. And I'll go ahead and cut this out and paste that in. 
go ahead and load cohorts. And let's go ahead then and put cohorts in here. Uh, and so that is going to be a vector that's repeated 10 times. And it needs to then, well, let's run this and make sure it works, <laughs> first of all. Good, nothing changed. Now let's come back up here and make cohorts a factor. So we'll do factor on that, and we'll do levels equals cohorts. And so what should happen now is that we should get things in the order of what we have up here, starting with pioneers going down to challengers. Very good, we have pioneers at the top and challengers at the bottom. Now what we wanna do is get a color scheme that goes in a logical progression. I would like pioneers to be red, like they're red hot for this thing, and challengers to be blue, like they're cold for this, and the neutrals and the wary observers to be kind of in the middle. So what we'll do is we'll come down and I will do scale color manual, and we need to give it values for our, uh, our color scheme, right? And so we're gonna need eight different colors going from red to cold. One of my favorite tools for doing this type of work is Color Brewer 2. You can go to colorbrewer2.org to get this. Um, you can insert the number of data classes. I have eight, it's kind of the upper end of what it will allow me to do. I have diverging data. And what I'd like is this color scheme here in the middle, right? And so we can see it going from red down to ice cold blue. Um, if you do things like colorblind safe, print friendly, photocopy safe, uh, you kind of see that you start losing a lot of things. But this red to blue color scheme is, is colorblind friendly. And so we've got this in hexadecimal. I'm going to go ahead and copy this uh, from the JavaScript array. And I'm going to plop it in here as my values. And I can replace those square braces with a C and a parentheses. Uh, and let's go ahead. And I think I'm missing a parenthesis here. And we need a plus sign at the end. Values is missing. I put value instead of values. Very good. We now have pioneers as being uh, solid red, challengers being pretty ice cold blue. And so I might want to go ahead and have a stroke around it, right? So if we use plotting symbol 21, we get a circle that we can put a border on. And so to do that, we need to do a couple changes. So we can do geom point and we'll do shape equals 21. This then gives us the circles where the, the color aesthetic colors the edge, right? And so I want my fill to be the cohort. And so now um, I have the black edge, but I still have scale color manual rather than scale fill manual. That looks a lot better. The lighter colors aren't getting washed out so easily. Um, but I am noticing some overplotting here. Uh, like right here, I only count five circles. We're missing three. Uh, and so there might be some on top of each other. And so I'd like to impose some type of dodging um, to, to separate those out a bit. And I'm curious if I can do that with geom point. If I could do like position equals dodge, and it wants a width. So let's go ahead and use the actual position dodge function. And we'll do width equals, let's do like 0 0.1. And that dodges it a bit. Uh, one thing I like about having the dodge is that everything is kind of moved in the same direction um, in each of the lines. So let's go ahead and increase that to 0.2, and that gets some more separation. Down here I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It's kind of hidden. So let's go ahead and jitter it instead um, of using the point. And so we'll again remove this position argument and do geom jitter. And so that's really wide and spread apart. Um, I'm kind of thinking we need to reduce the width on the jitter. So we'll go ahead and do height equals, let's do 0 0.1. So when we've got our categorical data on the y-axis, we want to change the height. Um, when we've got it on the x-axis, we want to control the width. So if I do like height equals 0 0.1, width equals 0, that should jitter things basically in the y-axis orientation, but not in the x-axis orientation. And so that looks pretty decent for splitting things apart. Maybe we could have a little bit bigger width. Let's go ahead, or height, I should say. So that looks pretty decent. Um, I'm afraid that if we get things too far apart, then it'll be hard to see. But then again, we could put in some light grid lines to separate out the different questions. Let's go up to maybe height equals 0 0.3. Yeah, that, that looks okay. At this point though, I'm thinking maybe we should just go back to the dodge so that it doesn't look so random and we can maybe put um, grid lines between each of the categories. 
Again, this is me thinking back and forth about what I want to do. So we'll go back to geom point. We'll do position dodge. I wonder if it'll let me do height equals 0 0.3. Let's try. No, nope, it didn't like height. Let's do width. Oh, and I need to have position equals position dodge. And so that is pretty tight. Let's increase it a little bit to maybe width equals 0 0.5. And that gets greater separation of the different points. In a way, it is like the order of the bar charts, but um, we're not tying it so tightly to the values on the X or Y axis in this case. So let's go up a little bit more to say like 0 0.6, and that looks pretty good. Now I'm gonna put in some thin lines between the categories. And so to do that, I will do uh, geom H line, and then we have Y intercept, and I'll do seek, uh, 0 0.5 to 10.5 by ones. Once I make sure that the lines work, I'll come back and style them some more. Cool, that looks good. And let's go ahead then and do our geom H line. Let's do line width equals 0 0.25, color equals gray. I think that looks nice. I think I would like to remove this extra padding on the Y axis. We've seen that before with what? <laughs> yes, with the expand argument in scale y discrete, uh, we can then do expand equals c 0 comma 0 and add that plus. Uh, we now get rid of that gap, but some of our points are getting clipped at the top. And so we can get rid of that clipping by doing chord Cartesian clip equals off. But now when we do that, we've got our line at uh, 0.5 um, coming off the bottom. So why don't we then with chord Cartesian, we'll do Y limb, go C 0 0.5 to 10.5. And that then makes sure that we're not kind of throwing all our data down and we're not um, clipping our points. So anyway, that looks good. The next thing I'd like to do is go ahead and shrink our legend down to remove some of the spacing between those labels and I'd like to see if we can move it inside the panel, maybe putting it down here in the bottom right corner. Of course, if we move this, then it's gonna get really wide and there'd be a nice home for it in the bottom right corner. So let's start by removing the name. So we'll do fill equals null, that goes away. So let's go ahead and compress down our legend. And with that, and that we can control by the key height. The key is the symbol, but it has a fair amount of padding around it. So we can do legend.key.height, and it takes units, uh, unit as a function. So I'll start with a value of zero PT, zero points, and that brings them together pretty tight. Uh, maybe we could have a little bit of space. Let's do three, it didn't do much. Let's do 10. That's a little bit more error. Let's go ahead and make the text smaller. Legend.text equals element text, and we'll do size equals uh, 10. It didn't, I think that actually made it bigger. <laughs> let's do five. That makes it small, maybe too small. So let's go up to eight. And I'm gonna make this eight as well so that the height is the same as the text. I think we saw that in the last episode when we were sizing the legend for the bar plot. All right, so let's try six and we'll call that good. And so now we have spacing around the key and around the text. So let's make it size instead of height. So size will do both the width and the height. And that brings it in pretty nice. I, I like that. So let's then put a border around it. And so then we can do legend.background. So remember, the borders can be controlled by the background. And we give that an element rect. And we can do color equals black. And so then we get a nice border around it like that. Um, and we can then go ahead and try to move that inside the plot. So we'll do legend.position and we'll say inside. And then we give it legend.position inside. And then we can give it an X and Y coordinates to place the legend. So I don't exactly know where it's gonna be in this. Let's go ahead and say like 0.8 on the X axis and then 0.2 on the Y axis. And so that moves it inside the plot. Just need to count my points to make sure I'm not overlapping anything. So I see the eight points there. Let's move it down and write a little bit. And you know what we could actually do is let's make this go out to 70% like we had for the bar plot. So we can do that here in Chord Cartesian with XLim uh, going from zero to 70. 
And so we see now that we go out to 70% here and our legend, I think is in a pretty good place. Maybe we could move it down a little bit. Um, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> let's do 0 0.1. Now let's go up a little bit. Let's do 0.15. A lot of splitting the difference, don't you think? So the plot needs a title because again, the previous version had a title as well as the caption. I think I'll come into labs here and do title and caption. Uh, and I will go ahead and copy over the text that we used for the previous episode. Very good. And so now we have our title and our caption. Let's go ahead and add in what we used before to get the title left justified. So we can do plot dot title position and we'll say plot. That'll put it on the left side and then we can do plot dot title. We'll do element text box simple. Uh, coming to us from ggtext, so we'll do library ggtext. And let's run all this and see what it looks like. And we see that we need some margin around our title uh, because it's all getting uh, compressed together there, right? We'll add that to our element text box simple, margin equals margin, and we'll do t equals, let's do uh, 10, b equals 15, and the default is points. That gets us some space. Let's go ahead and make that face bold. Uh, face equals bold. Good. Maybe we can make it a little bit bigger than the text we have on the y axis. Let's say size equals 20. That's really big. Uh, let's make it maybe 18. Uh, I think that's too big because then it's getting all this other stuff compressed. So let's go down to 15. Looks good. And I think maybe our margin at the top is too thick. So let's go ahead to the top and do a zero. And I think that looks pretty comfortable. Um, this text down here is on three lines. Maybe I'll bring that back up to make it two lines. Um, it might compress things laterally a little bit. So why don't I do that? So let's come back up here and remove that space there. That looks pretty good. And then I think I could also put another stage onto a single line um, as well. So let's go ahead and remove that line break. And I think that looks pretty nice. And the legend is still in a, in a good place. And now we want to go ahead and move our caption back over to the left. And so to do that, we will uh, add to this, we'll do plot.caption.position equals plot. Again, that'll pull it over to the left side. And we'll do plot.caption uh, equals element text. And let's do size equals eight. That made it smaller, but it's still right justified. We could probably make it even smaller. Let's go down to six. And then we'll do H just to make it left justified. Oh, what did I do? I did one. One is right justified. So it should be zero. And that pulls it over to the left. And I think that looks pretty slick. Um, I'm really happy with the way this turned out. Let me know what you think of this version of the figure. So I think, I think this is a lot simpler and easier to interpret than what we had here for the bar plot. It's the same data. Again, it's being represented in a different way. I don't think we gain anything by really cluttering things up by putting numbers <laughs> um, on the points. Um, the one tricky thing I feel is this dodging of the data that people might be wondering like, well, why do you have them all separated? But again, if we put them all on the same line, then um, a lot of things get covered up like we'd have right here, right? So let me know what you think. I like this, I'm, I'm a fan, <laughs> I would publish this. I certainly think this is better than the bar plot. And I think our title also is now tied better to the data because our data is in the order of what these researchers reported they would be willing to use AI to do. So again, let me know what you think of this down below in the comments. And if you have any ideas for other plots that you would like to see me give the treatment to, uh, feel free to add that down below in the comments as well. And as always, Thank you so much for watching. Please be sure to tell your friends about what's going on here at Code Club. Make sure you head over to the website so that you can register for the newsletter so that you can start thinking through these data, uh, thinking through these visualizations before I hop on here on YouTube to show you how I would go about implementing and re-implementing, recreating the plots, as well as uh, doing my own remix of the data like we did in today's episode. All right, thanks, and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.